On this week in enterprise tech, AT&T and Comcast up their speed game. But is it really positive? Plus cybersecurity, the dash, and all your news. Twyatt on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 134, recorded April 3rd, 2015. AT&T, Comcast, and other bad news. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Dropbox for Business. Dropbox for Business lets your team sync and share files just like Dropbox, but with IT admin tools that allow you to control and protect your company's information. Visit dropbox.com slash business for our free 14-day trial. That's dropbox.com slash business. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech. It's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballasare, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. But of course, I am not alone. I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, friend, and co twyatt geek, whatever, Mr. Brian Chi from the, direct, the director of the Advanced Network Computing Laboratory at the University of Hawaii. Uh, Brian, that is still not Hawaii. I, can, I know my locations, and that does not look like the sunny state of the geek in paradise. No, I am still at Interop Hot Stage. We are packing up and getting ready for the show, and I am playing Decrate Tetris, trying to make everything pack into some nice big wood crates. Uh, for the folks at home who have never had to play this, uh, explain what it's like to take a fully functioning enterprise class network and pack it securely enough so that it will make it to its destination without being completely destroyed. Oh, uh, I, you know, Tetris. You make <laughs> little blocks fit in different sizes and you try to get it all fit into a square. That's Decrate Tetris. And that square, those squares go into a 40 foot trailer, which gets trucked over to Las Vegas. Actually, I think Glenn told me it's a 52 foot, two Ooh. 52 foot trailers. Two fifty foot. Yeah. What did you guys pack? Oh, well, you know we've got software defined networks this year. Oh right, right. Okay, I got it. So it's going to be a little extra something, something. Speaking of a little extra something, something, we're going to jump straight into the enterprise blips. The first one is all about the FCC getting ready to open up some golden spectrum. Like la late last week, the FCC announced that they will vote on April 17th to allocate prime spectrum in the 3.5 gigahertz range to innovative uses in a spectrum sharing plan that could affect consumers, carriers, and data services. The so-called Citizens Broadband Radio Service, or CBRS, would open up the 3550 to 3700 megahertz frequencies in the same way that 2.4 and 5 gigahertz are used by Wi-Fi. Occupying a sweet spot between the insanely crowded, but well propagating 2.4 gigahertz, and the fast but weak 5 gigahertz bands, this newest set of frequencies would be a mashup of licensed and non-licensed use, along with services that will hopefully jump frequencies to prevent interference. Well, Google Chrome is going to banish the Chinese Certificate Authority resp responsible for a breach of trust. Seems our friends in China aren't playing nice and Google's Chrome browser will now stop trusting all digital certificates issued by the China Internet Network Information Center. Seems an intermediate authority out of Egypt that's subordinate to the Chinese uh, Internet Authority is responsible for issuing unauthorized certificates involved in a man-in-the-middle attack. You want faster wireless. Your enterprise needs faster wireless, and your carriers want to sell you faster wireless. Ruckus says, okay. While there have been wave 2 802.11ac products announced from the big players, including Cisco and HP, Ruckus has captured the first two market title with their ZoneFlex R710, providing multi-user MIMO 4x4 radio configurations in 5.8 and 2.4 gigahertz, a negative 104 dBm sensitivity, and support for 500 concurrent users 
The R710 can provide single-string access to mobile devices up to 200 megabits per second and two-stream access to laptops up to 445 megabits per second. Ruckus has capped the AP at 80 megahertz channels, even though 802.11ac allows for twice that, because they believe that configuration will provide the best combination of speed and concurrent users. And they claim that the R710 can pull 1.733 gigabits per second in 5 gigahertz, as well as 800 megabits per second in 2.4. To support that speed, the R710 will come with dual aggregated 1 gigabit per second uplinks and will support PoE along with a price tag of just under $1,300. Could Windows go open source? MS Technical Fellow Mike Mark Rusinovich says it's a new Microsoft. Seems Microsoft hinted that things are changing at, and at the open source-centric ChefCon this week, and Mark Rusinovich apparently dropped the bomb during discussion stating, it's definitely possible that Windows could eventually go open source. We've already seen the .NET environment go open, but he did add that such a move isn't going to happen quickly. The future of drone-enabled enterprises has landed in Canada. Upset with the glacial pace of regulation by the FAA over drones in the United States, Amazon has moved the testing for its delivery drones to Canada. Amazon has gathered quite the dream team of roboticists, aeronautical engineers, network gurus, and software experts towards creating a final unmanned link between their automated warehouses and the doors of customers. Amazon is doing most of their testing at 200 feet, above the height of most buildings, but below the 500 feet of general aviation. They're creating drones that weigh less than 55 pounds, can fly at least 20 miles, and carry up to 5 pounds of payload, which would account for 86% of their deliveries. Well, in a story that comes from MIT and via popular science, take a typing test and find out if you have the early signs of Parkinson's. The story in popular science reports on some MIT research that uses the patterns during typing to help diagnose the nervous system changes that apparently show up in the timing of how you type. They report that the first version of this study is looking at determining if the user is sleep deprived versus well rested. Don't hold your breath yet though. They've got a lot more work to do to refine the algorithm enough to be accurate. They hope to do an expanded test soon and hope for further development of this test to find Parkinson's earlier and to help better distinguish it from other motor control issues like rheumatoid arthritis. Do you have an Office 365 business plan? Well, now you get mobile management. Free! On Monday, Microsoft announced that they will be bundling mobile device management, ma management into all Office 365 commercial plans. MDM will allow system admins the ability to manage data across the premise, cloud, and connected iOS, Android, and Windows devices. If you are responsible for maintaining security across your enterprise, you now have the ability to create conditional access policies so that connected devices are only granted access to sensitive data if they comply with your security standards. Control device level security policies to prevent compromised devices from joining the network, such as jailbroken phones, and of course to initiate, initiate selective wipes, which will remove sensitive data from the user's computers and devices while leaving their personal data intact. Well, that does it for the blips. When we come back, we're going to jump into the Enterprise Bytes, and joining us will be Oliver Rist. He's a technology consultant and a regular here on This Week in Enterprise Tech. He's sort of aren't Jiminy Cricket. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the first sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Now, if you have ever, ever looked for the easiest, the best, the most efficient way to sync files and share files across a network, then you probably know about Dropbox. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that the vast majority of our audience uses Dropbox already. It is the best way to share everything from multimedia access to allow your teams to organize their most important data. But as ubiquitous as Dropbox has become, I'm also betting that there are those who don't realize that there's a Dropbox specifically designed for business. A Dropbox for Business is the better way to manage accounts, manage billing, and most importantly for those of us who have to keep an eye on how data travels across our networks, have visibility and control over your data. Dropbox for Business lets you do just that. So, you might be asking yourself, what exactly is Dropbox for Business? Well, it's the same easy-to-use, quick-to-set-up Dropbox that you users, employees already have and love, 
which is important because it means you don't have to retrain them, but it provides simple storage and sharing for any type of file on any platform on any device with IT policy. Worried about space? Well, don't. Because each Dropbox for Business user starts off with one terabyte of space, and it's easy to expand. Staff can collaborate with team members and securely invite control access to outside partners, clients, and vendors, basically with any file that they might have. And most importantly for IT professionals, Dropbox for Business has powerful admin controls like remote white, intuitive sharing and permission controls, plus complete audit logs. This way, IT can make sure that only the right people get access to sensitive company data. Now, Dropbox for Business integrates with third-party security and administrative solutions such as SIEM, DLP, and eDiscovery for even more control. And last but not least, the robust Dropbox for Business infrastructure uses encryption for file data in transit and at rest, plus segmentation and hashing to anonymize files. Extra security features are available like single sign-on and two-step verification. Basically, any way you want to use it, you'll be able to use Dropbox for Business. You already use Dropbox on your own personal machine, and 4 million businesses use it right now. Why look for another solution when you've already got the one that works? Want to give it a try? Take advantage of your employee, employees' familiarity with Dropbox and sign up for Dropbox for Business. Visit dropbox.com slash business. That's dropbox.com slash business for a free 14-day trial of Dropbox for Business. Again, that's dropbox.com slash business. And we thank Dropbox for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Now, let's go ahead and get into the Enterprise Bytes. We welcome back into the discussion Mr. Oliver Rist. He is a technology consultant. He's a regular on This Week in Enterprise Tech. And he provides us really a, a no-spin, no-holds-barred view to what's happening in technology. Oliver, welcome back to the show. Hi there. Now, I have to ask you, because I, I gave Tubert all that time, what are you up to? What have, what have you been doing the last couple of weeks? What have I been doing the last couple of weeks? What have I been doing the last couple of weeks? Not a whole hell of a lot, uh, which, is, which is good for me and bad for you. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take that. Well, gentlemen, let's go ahead and jump into the first story. This is sort of a multi-parter. We have seen in the last week sort of a, a, I don't want to say it's an evolution, but it's definitely a development in high-speed internet and how it's offered to consumers and to businesses. Now, yesterday, AT&T launched its new U-verse Gigapower service in parts of Cupertino. Now, this is after AT&T launched similar high-speed internet in Dallas, Kansas City, Fort Worth, North Carolina, Austin. And they're also planning, according to their interactive map, Chicago, St. Louis, Nashville, Atlanta, Charlotte, Jacksonville, Miami, San Antonio, and others. Oh, we know that this is blazing fast. It's, it's one gigabit per second, which if we were using this as a commercial, we would say, oh, it's like 24 songs in a second. It's a high-definition movie in half a minute. But we also know that it's pricey. It's $80 for 300 megabits per second, 110 for one gigabit per second. You can add TV for $150 up, uh, total, and you can up it to 180 which gives you TV and phone as well as high-speed internet. Uh, let me throw this over to you first, Oliver. Mm. It was not that long ago. In fact, a year, maybe 18 months, that you had executives from Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, all the big ISPs who said, look, customers just don't want high speed. We've offered it. Nobody's buying it. That's why we don't care if Google does this Google Fiber because nobody wants gigabit Ethernet. What's, what's changed? Uh, they stopped drinking. I don't know. Good. Um, <laughs> I, I, I actually remember them saying that, and it took me a while to, to wipe the coffee that I snorted out of my nose when I was reading that. Um, uh, it's gone back and forth, right? Because not just have they said that and changed their minds, then they came out and said, if we pass net neutrality, we won't have the money to afford mm -hmm. the infrastructure to speed up uh, our services. And now, what, two months later, they're, they're doing it anyway. Which I guess makes a perverse kind of sense if they're going to come back in a couple of months and say, oh, well, we could do it here, but now that you've passed this, we can't do it anywhere else. Something like that. I don't know. Uh, bottom line, it's for me, it's a, it's a bait and switcher. Um, mm -hmm. it's, something they're, it's something they're going to promise and either change or, or you know, fail at uh, deploying or, or use as a, as a lever to, uh, against the rest of us to knuckle under to all their other crap if uh, if we want them to deploy this elsewhere 
Uh, Chiever, I I've heard exactly what Oliver is speaking of, this whole bait and switch as sort of, no, 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 you, you don't need alternatives. You don't need any of that other stuff. Uh, don't don't let Google into your city because we've got you covered. I mean, you want it fast. This, this is fast. And it's the same price as Google Fiverr. Do you see this as this is generally them saying, okay, this is a product that they need? Or is AT&T just saying, well, we'll deploy enough cities so that we can make the case that you don't need a third party coming in? Actually, I'm going to agree with Oliver. I'm wow. personally thinking this is this is going to be, you know, oh, your first taste is cheap. But, <laughs> you know, I don't know. All I know is that, you know, with the FCC redefining what broadband is, I actually have an XLTE MiFi that on the brand new XLTE towers, I'm getting 100 meg up, 100 meg down. So that means I now have a cellular modem that qualifies as broadband according to the new definition and my cable modem doesn't. Hmm. So, hmm, this is interesting. Mm. Uh, Oliver, let me throw something back to you because mm. there is a little extra wrinkle here and some people are congratulating AT&T for being upfront about it. Other people mm. are grumbling. That's how it always is. And it's privacy. So AT&T is saying if you take that $80 price for 300 or 110 for the full gigabit per second, you are explicitly allowing us to spy on your traffic so that we could sell anonymized data to advertisers. But but they do say, if you don't want that, if you absolutely don't want your data used by us in any way, shape, or form, you can pay $29 additional per month and you'll opt out of tracking. Do you see that? Is this is this progress? Is this, is this a, an ISP being honest about what they're going to do with their data or is this just more nickeling and diming? Uh, it's progress in the sociopathic business practices. Yes, if you're if you're uh, Hannibal Lecter as a CEO, then this is a great step forward. Um, I, I just makes me tense up just thinking about it. I'm going to start twitching. Uh, <laughs> the 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 concept that that we're 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 going to spy on you and you need to you need to pay us to not do that. I don't see how that in any way is a positive or a or a step forward or something being done in the interest of the national good. However, they're phrasing it. It's just a, it's just, it's a, it's a flat out additional service fee, just a variant on that, uh, which, which they're already getting sued over. So I'm starting to stutter. I'm that pissed off. I'm starting, it's, I hate it. I hate it. I think it's bad. I think they should get taken to court over it, uh, even if it's not illegal, just on general principle. Um, yeah. I'm going to stop talking now. You know, Oliver, it, it reminds me of, do you remember uh, back in the day when you had to pay extra for them not to list you in the phone book? Yeah. It, it, this exactly. is the same sort of thing. It's like, well, oh, of course, price. of course we're going to list you. And, oh, if you don't want it, that's fine. I mean, you're going to have to pay us extra because that's that's a thing we have to do for you. That's a service to not list you. It, it, this feels almost exactly the same. I hate them. I really <laughs> hate them. <laughs> Okay. okay, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Oliver unclench for a bit. I'm gonna use cleanse, breathe, breathe, Oliver. Okay, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna shift over to Chibert here for a second. Chibert, there there is another wrinkle here that I think <laughs> okay. we may have lost Chibert. <laughs> okay. I think we're kind of all laughing because it's hard to put a good spin on this. It feels so much like extortion, and I wanna I wanna say okay, good on AT and T for for at least being open about the fact that they're going to spy on us. But yeah, the people in the chat room are saying, this is a form of blackmail. This is, this is oh yeah, we'll give you the cheaper price, but you got to let us sell you as a product. Uh, Chibert, let's, let's, let's pile onto this thing. There is one little extra wrinkle to this, I think might make Oliver just go into full-on uh, conniptions here. Oh, thanks. And that is that these super awesome prices that you get from AT&T that they want to prove is is the, the you know why you don't need other competition it's only available in cities in which google fiber already exists if you're trying to get service in a city in which google fiber doesn't exist the prices all start forty dollars higher so it's 120 for 300 megabits per second it's 150 for the full gigabit per second so in other words if you have another option you can get it cheaper which is strange because that's exactly what they haven't been telling us the last couple of months. They've been saying, no, 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 we're already giving you rock bottom even though we have no competition. Uh, could, could you, because uh, I'm sure Oliver right now is probably biting parts of his body. <laughs> Chiebert, tell me, what is, what is this? This is pure and simple 
uh, Google is doing a good job of keeping other people honest. You know, there's competition is good. I love competition and I want Google in my town. And if AT&T wants to keep being a big giant incumbent in Honolulu, I think they're going to have to start thinking very hard. Uh, but I will, I will give AT&T one little bone here. I just got a chance to experience their enterprise version of their um, mobile carrier services. And the difference between consumer and enterprise is freaking night and day. Damn. I love the enterprise services. But I do love competition too. And I personally think that it'd be great to have gigabit Ethernet for ten ninety five a month. But then again, you know, I still believe in the Easter Bunny. Right. Oh, we've got Chicken Head in the uh, 21 in the chat room saying, well, who's to say that they won't spy on you even if you do pay? And I'm sure Oliver would, would agree with me here. I mean, you just, you trust at and I mean, if you give them money, of course, they're not going to do what they say they're not going to do. Right? Oh, I, I would have people from at and come and babysit my children. <laughs> I, I, I trust them <laughs> implicitly. No, I think, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm Can we get that. a sad trombone sound on the TriCaster? <laughs> we really need one. <laughs> Oliver's head is going to explode. Yeah, no, oh, it's just no. I mean, <laughs> yeah, no. If you pay the money, of course they're they're not going to spy on you, and of course they wouldn't they they wouldn't store that data in any case and give it to anybody at the slightest provocation, be it monetary or legal. Uh, yeah, no. It's it's it's. I think you're. What is it for? Twenty nine dollars a month extra. Yep. Uh, I don't think it protects you in any way whatsoever. I think it just. Uh, it gives you an extra line item on your bill. Exactly. Yes, it's an extra twenty nine bucks a month you can't spend at Starbucks. Oh, fine. Okay. Uh, hey, but unfortunately, we're not done with the story yet. It's Hebert, I, I want to throw back to you because you did talk about Google. Google, good job, fantastic. We love it. But when Google started doing Google Fiber, they made it very clear. They said it multiple times that we do not want to become an ISP. We want to show ISPs what good service can be. Specifically, they said, we want to show that there's a demand for high-speed internet. Now, we're starting to see that. Both Comcast, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and AT&T are rolling out these next-gen networks with ultra-high speed. Is this mission accomplished? Can Google, Fiber, can Google now say, okay, well, Fiber's done its place. Much like the Nexus lines of phones, we can say, it, now they, they're on the right path, we can pull back, and they can do the investment in the infrastructure, and Google Fiber needs to go no further. No, I don't think Google's done. I think what I think Google Fiber is going to be key towards their so-called virtual mobile carrier services. The two go hand in hand because remember, I I keep highlighting that the biggest cost or one of the largest costs in mo being a mobile carrier is the backhaul. And I think what I think Google's not done. I think they're they've got more things that are going to be coming up. Uh, I personally think there's going to be a revolution in things like video conferencing, and that's going to require the higher bandwidth. I really and truly think that Google hasn't even warmed up yet mm. and that the uh, carriers are going to have to watch out because Google's going to say, no, 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 I'm raising the bar and try to catch up. All right. Oh, uh, Oliver, mm. there are going to be people who say, wait a minute. You know, there's there's all this Google talk, Google this, Google's doing right, Google's forcing AT&T and Comcast to release their, their next-gen high-speed networks. But there will be those other voices. And, in fact, we've got a couple of, uh, of those in, uh, in the chat room. We've got Olivia Anchovy saying, I'll Google. Google admittedly collects your data. That's what they do. That's their business model. But mm -hmm. somehow we trust them more. Is it is it because we've actually heard, we've seen them take the government to task you know, wh about privacy? Is it because we've seen them knock down some of these telcos that were previously unreachable? Is, is, it, is it just hero worship at the moment, or do we actually believe that Google is doing a better job with providing service and protecting data? Hero worship. Oh, it is? Okay. So I'd have to go. I don't, I don't see any evidence of them having an actual tangible track record that's better than you know, any, anyone else's. Yes, they've spoken out. But so have a bunch of other people, including uh, the carriers. I don't see them actually having done anything. Wow. Or succeeded. I, 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 this is fantastic. Okay, uh, Chibert, same question to you. Is, is, is there a tangible effect or is this hero worship? Well, I think it's just a matter of, you know, AT&T's 
and people like that have been around a heck of a lot longer than Google. And, um, you know, it, give them enough time. I'm sure Google will probably um, pull some kind of bonehead maneuver that's going to get everybody to start hating them. But the reality is, is you know, so far so good. I'm not sure I'd say I trust Google more. Um, I just think I have left less knives in my back from Google at the moment. <laughs> oh, yeah, that might actually be the best way to look at it. I mean, they yeah. all have a vested interest in invading your privacy. But as Oliver pointed out, right now, we kind of hero worship Google. Uh, we don't have really good reasons to do it other than we've seen AT&T and Verizon and Comcast really screw up. But maybe it just takes that one huge breach, breach of trust and suddenly Google gets tossed on the, the pile with the rest of them. Now, speaking of the rest of the pile, let's move on to the second part of the story because we are going to start running a little long on, on this, this enterprise bite. Comcast joined the fray as well. Just this week, they announced that uh, they've got an Us2 service. They will have a next-gen rollout of their network that will increase speeds up to 2 gigabits per second. So it's almost 22 million customers across the country. That's twice as fast as Google's top-tier offerings, and that's the same for AT&T, and 80 times faster than typical Comcast standard internet. Now, they'll roll it out first in Atlanta. They say that the service will be available to customers with close proximity to, the, to their fiber network. So wherever they have a fiber termination, they'll be able to run the 2 gigabit service. It will require professional installation. So there's no self-installation kit here because it's you, you are going to have to do some, some pretty serious networking. And the hardware on the consumer level doesn't actually yet exist. All the technology is there, but they haven't created the product. So it's still something in, in you know the, the, the offering for the future. Chiba, let's start with you first. There's a lot of people who are saying that this is just a defensive move. And Comcast is saying, wait, wait, you know, we're still, we're still number one. We're still tops. And honestly, if you compare Comcast service to anyone's DSL, it's going to be faster. But what do you see? Why, why did they announce this service that is not going to be available at least until late next year? This is classic vaporware. Okay. Uh, I, I love the fact that they're just saying it's two gigabits per second. Just like I see a lot of people say, oh, my, I actually have 200 megabits per second on my thing. No, they've got 100 megabits in each direction. Uh, I'm laying odds that Comcast has probably got a gig in each direction, but they're calling it two gig just because it's right. marketing hype. No, I think this is vaporware. I think Comcast is the evil empire. Um I have been bitten by Comcast's um, weirdness more and more. You know, I, you know, I went through all kinds of sh wonderful times trying to uh, get a VPN working over at Oliver's place when he was uh, first time on the East Coast, and you know, Comcast never fails to disappoint me for doing weird things to the market. Right, right, Oliver. I'm going to be contrarian here because everyone loves to pile on Comcast. And I have not had great experience with Comcast. But I will say that any time I had a, had a choice between DSL and Comcast, Comcast has always been far faster and usually cheaper than anything I can get from AT&T or Verizon. Why do we hate Comcast so much? And is this something that we should look forward to or do you see it as purely a defensive move? Oh, you're bundling a whole bunch of questions in there. Uh, yes. Kind of like, uh, you know, an AT&T customer service agreement. Um, I got to go with Chibert on this. Uh, they're the evil empire, <laughs> although I, I, now they're the co-evil empire with, with AT&T out there. But um, I, I, I wouldn't tie bandwidth speeds into whether or not we like Comcast. That's a technology mm -hmm. limitation. I don't, I don't, that, that doesn't have any, any impact on corporate politics to me. Uh, I would, I think we hate them because they are unabashedly opportunistic, uh, predatory. Um, if there's a way they can, they can screw you out of the last, you know, little bit of effort they need to provide versus the dollar that you pay, they will do that. Uh, and they've proven it over and over again. And that's been a long-term rep. I don't know. I don't, even, I don't even know why you're trying to be positive about where you're getting that from. Where would well, you get that from? Well, I mean, okay, I, 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 have, I have beef with Comcast. I've had some serious issues with them in the past. But 
I mean, they do have the fastest network. If, if you wanted the fastest network in most places where you will have multiple technologies avail available to you, unless you've got Google, Comcast is going to be faster, which... But then that, that just makes this, this vaporware even worse. That's true. That's that true. means that they have it and they just aren't giving it to you, right? Yeah. That, that, that uh, Akamai study just came out, the worldwide uh, fastest countries, right? Top, top 10 and the U.S. isn't on them, but say Latvia is, right? This just goes to show if, if they can actually back this up, that means we could be, they just don't want us. Yeah. They just want us to keep paying for slower because it's easier. Now, there's a couple of people in the chat room who are yelling that, you know, the United States has the worst internet of any major developed country. And I won't go that hyperbolic, but I will say that there is very much this feeling of we, we can kind of like Comcast because AT&T is really bad as well. And we don't really have a good choice unless, unless you could, you're, you're lucky enough to live in an area where you've got a really good regional ISP, a local ISP, something like Sonic.net, or again, you've got Google Fiber, you've never had an experience of a telco that wasn't really trying to screw you over. And it's sort of like saying, well, you know, that hyena is eating my leg, but it's better than that other hyena who also wants to take my arm. Uh, Chibert, what about you? Do, you? do you live in a place where you've got a telco not trying to take an organ? I'm not super happy with any of my choices at the moment. Um, I'm actually happier with that XLTE um, MiFi than my uh, cable carrier. I've had tons and tons of dropouts. Um, um, there, I've had weird, weird routing. You know, it's. I, I think someone at my ISP seems to be smoking something because <laughs> I've done a trace route to try and get to um, one of my servers, and it route uh, my routing went through Chicago. And it's like, Ooh. okay, that, that's not good. Um, no, I think, you know, it, everybody's trying to make a buck. I, I don't blame them for that. But they are certainly doing a pretty, pretty good job of taking advantage of people that haven't had choices. So while I'm not sure I trust Google implicitly, but I will say go Google Beat the other, beat up the other guys. Make the market more competitive, uh, because I want better services for less money. And gee, if I had better bandwidth, more reliable bandwidth, um, maybe I can go and invent the next web browser, you know, so to speak. Well, Chiber did mention that there was someone in the state of Hawaii who was smoking something. So that normally means that it's time to move on to the next story. This one I hope will be quick. I, I do want to get your uh, your stands on this. We've talked about big data and privacy a lot in, in the last two years or so because as we go to bigger and bigger data sets, it's been more difficult to prove that the anonymization or the depersonalization of information is working properly. Oh, it's the promise of big data, right? That we can somehow get big data together, remove all PII or personally identifiable information and get the benefits of having these huge data sets that represent real world activity without compromising the security of any of the people who make up that data set. Now, in 2014, the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario, Canada, teamed up with the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation to create a white paper that concluded that de-identification done correctly is bulletproof, with less than a 1% risk of getting PII, that's again, personally identifiable information, out of a given data set. Because, and, and they were fine with that because that's actually less than the risk of getting personally identification, identifiable information out of the trash can of an individual that you're trying to identify. However, on the other side, you have some of the authors of that very same white paper who are saying, uh, no, 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 the, the media misheard what we wrote. What we're trying to say is that done correctly, de-identification and anonymization can be an effective tool, but that sort of rigorous randomization of data rarely actually happens. Are the Oliver, let me throw this over to you first. Are these mutually exclusive? You've got researchers who seem to be saying the same, the, the opposite sides. One, which is you can anonymize data properly, and the other side, not really. You, you have the right tool, and you can find out who that anonymous data is about. Which is it? Run down for me what the correct procedure is. Uh, well, that's, that's the that's thing. Uh, they, they talk about uh, the quote-unquote uh, rigorous anonymization, but they don't really say what rigorous anonymization means. But one little clue towards the, the end of the white paper, 
says that basically nobody would meet the standards of rigorous anonymization. Yeah, so it's a it's hot air, <laughs> right? I mean, it's mm. a it's a it's a nice title. It's an eye catcher. It's a it's a, what you call it sticky eye type title, but it doesn't. It's probably not from what you're describing here. It's not going to be uh, based on anything real, right? right. It's a, it'll be a theoretical scenario that that we that you can't hit in real life. Uh, Oliver, let me, let me ask you. There's a couple of different ways that we could take this. If if we were to get practical about our personal information and the world, a we could assume that our PII will leak in some way, shape, or form. We could just, we could just assume that. It will doesn't it? matter how high. It could be my email. It could be someone descrambled something that I had sent off into the ether. No matter what it is, somehow my information will get out there, and I'll just have to live my life as if people will have access to my personal information. B, we could randomize everything. Absolutely everything. We've got people in the chat room who are saying, well, why would you use any of these telcos without using a, an end-to-end -end VPN? And that could be one way, that you live your life as if people are always trying to spy on you and you will try to stop them. Or we could push through some legislation to demand that quote-unquote rigorous anonymization. Do any of those sound good to you? Do any of those sound like they might be a way you would go with? Or maybe a combination? I don't know. Honestly, the last year has me thinking that maybe these, the, the, the pace at which these studies keep coming out at is designed simply to get us to just give up. Yeah. Right. It's just mm. too, it's too hard. Right. I mean, if, if, if you and I really want to be anonymous right now, I mean, I would, I would have to hack into the wireless of somebody across the street from me. I'd have to be using a Tor client. Everything would have to be encrypted on a, on a constant. I mean, it, it just, the list is just too much of a pain in the, mm -hmm, right. So, uh, I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> no, I, that's actually a good point. <laughs> it's, just, it's just too damn troublesome to, to, to try to, to protect yourself. And I don't even operate under the assumption that my, my information will leak. I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, it has. Right. Well, yeah, that, and then that's the other thing, which is even if, even if you could say, okay, this organization and this organization that I deal with, they've done it right. Your data is in so many different organizations in so many disparate industries that it's, I, I think in this day, it's impossible to say you will never get some sort of personal identification off of me. Uh, Achiever, let me, let me ask you about that. We've got Oliver and actually Web5784 in the chat room who are saying, look, the only real option is go off the grid. If you really, really want this, the only way to do it is to not participate. Is, is that what we're talking about? I mean, is, do we, are, we, are we at that point, that kind of jaded sense of privacy? Well, you know, unless you win the lottery, in which case your name is splashed all over the place, going off the grid for the bulk of the world is not really, you know, viable. <laughs> uh, what I will I will point out though is having being truly anonymous is counterproductive to the goals of most governments, even our U.S. government. So why would the U.S. government make it easier to become anonymous when it's not in their best interest? I should also point, I also want to point out that, you know, we're talking about corporations and organizations not having PII on their servers. That's, that's a good thing. Keep going. I like that. Um, PCI um, certification for credit card, very good thing. But I should point out that a lot of these Breaches a lot of where you get identity theft isn't really in these large organizations. Yeah. We see them, you know, they're they're big blasts, but a lot of this is coming from people being stupid and clicking on, you know, that free car offer and email and so forth. That's where a lot of these leaks are happening. And realistically, if the bulk of the world would actually go and scan their machine, actually run anti-malware, actually run a real firewall, kind of like what our friends at IDIS Networks is proposing, um, and reduce the, at the attack surface for the world, it might no longer be profitable to go and be a fisher of, you know, things. It, you know, that... that the same argument goes, you know, when I was, you know, working with some three-letter agencies. If we can reduce the, say, for instance, the cocaine trade coming from South America up to the United States by 50 percent, that means all of a sudden the drug dealers can't spend the money 
as much money on bribes. They can't spend as much money on this or that. Um, even, you know, hacking it in half can make a really, really big difference. And I am totally in favor of what Dan Gear at Black Hat um, keynote proposed, reduce the attack surface. And I think some magic might actually start happening. It's interesting because when we talk about data breaches, especially from the last year, we tend to focus on financial and medical breaches. Those were the big ones. But the story there is not that there were breaches, because of course there are breaches. I think the story, the real story, is the fact that those industries have to report. They, they, I mean, that's required of them to report. They're regulated industries. There are all those other breaches that happen in industries that are not regulated. I mean, retailers of just online blogs, online uh, magazines, online services that require that take down personally identifiable information that will get breached, and then they'll either fold or they might. Maybe if they're good, they'll send out an email saying you should change your password. But that's where the majority of this information leaks out. And there's no practical way to legislate it unless, and Oliver, I'm sure you, you'll, you'd be all for this, if we, we do very strong regulation on anyone who's ever go on the internet, uh, will go on the internet, because I think that will solve everything, right, if the government gets very involved in that. Yeah, no, we should, we should lock that down. Totally. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. <laughs> Okay. All right. Let's, let's back off the sarcasm button for a bit. Uh, I, Oliver, I do want to go to a story that you threw into the mix uh, right before the show because it, it's actually, this is good. This is, this is breaking news. This is good stuff. We know a little bit about the president signing a new executive order dealing with cybersecurity sanctions. Can, can, you, can you fill us out a little bit here? What are we talking about? Yeah, it's not exactly breaking news. It's uh, it's about two day old news. And what made it news was nobody could tell whether it was a joke or not. So... <laughs> What they did was they, they released this information on April Fool's Day, and it, was, uh, it came out as, as a blog post by a guy named Michael Daniel, who's assistant of something, something, something to somebody with cyber, uh, with, uh, uh, in association with cyber terrorism at the White House. And he said that we've, we've now solved all of your terrorism problems because we have this powerful new tool, an executive order. And the executive order that he outlined uh, it was a lot of language. It was it was an FAQ that he wrote it up as in this one post, which was subsidized by some other info. It was very long, and it boils down to uh, apparently the president has now authorized the secretary of the treasury, the attorney general, and the secretary of state to get together. And let me just point out, it's a they can get together. They don't actually have to, um, and then uh, impose international sanctions unspecified um, against. Anyone that the Secretary of the Treasury has designated as a some kind of cyber villain or cyber villainous entity, right? right. So what made it news was it was such vapor and uh, vapor speak, uh, uh, just hot air uh, that I'm having trouble articulating it. Uh, that people could not tell actually whether it was an April Fool's joke or not. And, and, and part of that is, and it's not. Yeah, because this executive order has has tied together security agencies along with the Secretary of the Treasury. They now have the power to say if you are in some way or shape or form supporting what they call cyber terrorism because the executive order, remember everyone, if you've read it, it now equates cyber terrorism with a national emergency. So it is one of the things that is most prescient in attacking the United States. If you give them money, you could now be considered a target under this ex executive order. You are now doing something illegal under this executive order. Which, uh, as many people have pointed out, means if you give money to Snowden or uh, anyone else who's trying to release secrets about the United States, you could be considered abetting terrorism. Uh, that's, again, I, I know, Oliver, that's the part that you're kind of just lolling about because you, it sounds so strange. Chiebert, what, what do we do with this? I mean, on, on the one hand... I like to see the United States government making strides towards cybersecurity. On the other hand, to now say that anyone who has any sort of financial connection to someone who may or may not do something that they consider cyber terrorism can now be considered a cyber terrorist themselves, that seems not just strange but dangerous. Uh, this is sounding like a really, really bad April Fool's joke, if you ask me. You know, there, there's, there's many things that can be done. The... You know, they might have slipped it in on April first on purpose so that people might ignore it. It's certainly a way for them to go and throw more money at cyber terrorism and 
say that there's precedence for it. And it's certainly a way for the uh, folks at, like at the Bureau to have, you know, cover, do a bit of CYA if they go a little too far. Now, think about this. If someone is accused of supporting, say, someone like Snowden, then suddenly they've just justified the stinger. They've mm -hmm. just justified mm -hmm. uh, putting taps on your ISP. Um, it's this is a very slippery slope of, you know, gee, this is starting to sound like the, you know, things that the KGB used to do during the Cold War. You know, are we turning into, you know, something like the KGB? Are we turning into a communist state that um, is going to start suppressing personal liberties? You know, you know well, uh, one of the ahead. one of the scarier elements that I, I read. Um, in, and one piece of analysis was, if you look at the executive order, because it is so vague, because it is so nebulous, they could see it being used as a reason to seize data centers. So if a piece of information is hosted in a particular data center, they could see the hosting of that data center as financial support to a cyber terrorist. And therefore, it would bypass all of the last three years of of uh, uh, of legal wrangling we've had on whether or not the United States government has the ability to seize data out of a data center that is shared by many. They can now just say, no, I've got an executive order and this executive order trumps anything that you might argue against me. Uh, that's the part that really scares the crap out of me because not only does it now bypass due process, but it bypasses basic law enforcement. I think we're all just going to... Yeah, we're just nodding on this. Yeah, I don't, no. I, I don't, I don't think executive orders have that kind of power, dude. Well, I mean, no, well, they certainly don't. But they're not supposed to. I got to go but with Schubert on this more. This is more yeah. like an like a CYA deal, right? If this is if they do something, they can point to this and say, "Well, it's okay because we did it because this says it in some weirdo language." Yeah, if you're going to be making some sweeping changes in, say, something that might affect civil liberties, you don't do that in one law you don't do that in one executive order you have to build a whole foundation of bricks um in order to bypass a lot of the things that our founding fathers set up so sweeping changes require a lot of work and i'm just thinking this might be just the first brick this might be the foundation stone that they're going to try and use to change things and i for one don't like it very much i'm hoping it's more benign but you know i'm not so sure Right. I, I, you know, I'm tired of being negative. Let's move on to stuff that's positive and weird and funny because this was supposed to be a fun week. Let's go talk about the Microsoft Surface 3. So non-pro, <laughs> this, this was where the RT used to live, but this one is a full Windows 8 tablet. It's sub $500. It's Intel Atom powered. It's 1.37 pounds, 10.8 inch screen, hybrid capabilities of a laptop and tablet, basically the whole rigmarole of Surface. But now, one that's actually affordable to people. Oliver, let me throw this to you. Do we care? Other than the fact that we can say bye-bye to RT? Yeah. Uh, not really. <laughs> no? Yeah. You know, the, the funny thing about this is it's actually a really good device. This would have been great if they had this four years ago. Yeah, Could exactly. Exactly. Tiebert? Can I trade in my two Surface RTs and get one of these? <laughs> I know. I, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Because the RT wasn't a bad device. I just couldn't do much with it. Uh, and and this, no. is, this is one of these things that it's actually, you know, 1.37 pounds, 10.8 inch screen. This is, this is a great tablet from 2011. You know, th this, this would be something I'd really like to have back then. But, but now, I mean, we saw this at CES. There's that movement away from tablets. Tablets are kind of a dying market. I mean, they're not, it's not dead, but it's not growing anymore because what's, what's coming back are hybrid notebooks, um, and with multiple capabilities, and I should be excited about this Surface 3 because it's, it's right in there, but I don't. I don't feel like this is going to be a huge seller. Well, the Surface 3, you know, from this description, this is feeling more like um, maybe a Chromebook, but yeah. it's kind of expensive for a Chromebook, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, because you can get an i3-powered Acer with the same size screen with more functionality Far more power, I think, for like a hundred dollars more. 
You can get a twelve hundred dollar Chromebook too, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. I don't know. I, is it, looking at this, and you know, when we when we start considering BYOD devices, it would be easier to lock down a Windows tablet slash notebook than it would be for a, a standard tablet. But uh, I don't know. I. I, I still feel happy because it, it's cool. I like it. I like the fact that it's sub $500. I, I think they'll sell a, a few of them. I do want to see if Microsoft will continue the, the non-pro surface. Uh, this will av be available in May, and it does come with a one-year subscription to Office 365. So maybe, maybe decent for well, deployment? I, I, I'll have one last spin on this. I've been working an awful lot with thin clients, and the management pieces for thin clients are Byzantine at best. They're ex you know, the management's the expensive part. Thin clients are cheap, but management is a pain. But keep in mind, our friends at Microsoft just threw open a uh, mobile management piece for free yeah. to the enterprise. And now the Surface 3 in this range, which is, oh, by the way, in the same realm as a good thin client... Except now I can work offline because I've got Office 365 and I've got some other apps and things like that. I'm going to predict that this is the way Microsoft's starting off by saying thin clients are dead. Long live the low-end tablet convertible laptop thing. <laughs> thing, I like that. Which They've kind of been saying. <laughs> they've, they've kind of been saying that. Let's do one last one. And this one, uh, you know, this sounds stupid. When I when I first read this, I thought it was an April Fool's prank. But then I got home and I had an invitation into this program. And hopefully I'll get these sometime in the, the following week. You've heard of the Amazon Dash, uh, Oliver, Gbert? Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. So sounded like the stupidest thing ever. These are network-connected buttons. Essentially, it's a recreation of of the one-click button on the Amazon site. Just click it and buy it. It gets sent to you. You're all good. You put these where you have consumables in your house. So next to your microwave, next to your, your laundry machine, in the bathroom where you can order toilet paper, whatever it's going to be. And you push the button after you've set it up, and it will do a one-click buy. And next thing you know, it, if, you've, if you're an Amazon Prime member two days from now, it will arrive at your house. Again, sounds stupid, but I could see them making a lot of money on this. Uh, but more importantly than that, this is actually an Internet of Things thing because this is a network device. It's an interesting take on an Internet of Things device, though, because it kind of gives smarts to your shopping. W what do you think, Oliver? I hate it. <laughs> I, just, I just hate it. Right. I'm going to start sticking little refrigerator magnet logos of stuff all over my house because I can't be bothered to remember this when I'm at the grocery store. I don't, it's just, just a useless. This is why people hate Americans is because we think this is a good idea because we're that lazy. We just, oh, I can't write a shopping list. I need to stick this crap all over my house so that when I, whenever something runs down, I can press a button and some wacky thing can launch from Canada and fly down and, and give me Tide. But wait, wait, Oliver, Oliver, come on. I mean, sometimes I'm doing my laundry and we're out of detergent or almost out of detergent. My phone is upstairs. I have to go all the way upstairs to do a mobile one-click buy, or I could just push the button next to the empty Tide bottle. I mean, come on, who wouldn't want that? Go to the grocery store and buy some Tide. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I mean, but Chevert, come on! It's the Internet of Things, right? We're we're enterprise guys. We're network guys. We like the Internet of Things. The I, of things I actually thing? like this. I I've signed up for it. Yeah, I, see, I go that's grow. two of us. Two of us have signed up for it. Uh, keep in mind, I I use <laughs> I do the subscription for uh, K cups, and the cool thing about it is that it it orders them for me so I don't have to remember to go and order them or go to the store and buy them. The downside to it is sometimes we drink less of, you know, one type of tea or whatever, and suddenly I've got this big surplus and I've got to go log in and to cancel the next order. This is kind of flipping it the other way around. I can put it next to my uh, K-Cup brewer, and when I notice that it's starting to go you know, get low, I'll just push the button. And by the way, almost working uh, from the chat room. The cool thing about this is you can press that button as many times as you want, but it will only do one order and won't reset until it's um, your 
previous order has shipped. So you, you're not going to have some drunken party goer pushing your Tide button a million times and suddenly you've got a semi-truck of Tide backing up to your house. Uh, Oliver, I, I understand what you're talking about and I, I, I bemoan much of the same thing, but I couldn't help myself when I got that invitation. I said, yes, please send me a few of those buttons. And I didn't even care what brands they sent me. I just wanted to see how they work because that's one of the things that Amazon is actually encouraging. They want people, developers, to see what other uses you can find for these Internet of Thing buttons. The tiny little buttons, they, they, I think the battery will last for five years. You, you set them up with a Bluetooth device to hook up to your, to your network, and now you can make them do things. Maybe, maybe this is not the thing you wanted to do, but could you see devices like this being used in a useful way other than just making us incredibly lazy? Can I see connected devices being used to do useful things? <laughs> yeah. I don't think this is one of them, but yeah, sure. No, Internet of Things is a, is a viable future trend. I'm not arguing that. I just It's just sad that the first real example we're going to see, uh, a household example, is going to be a, a nebulously defined smart fridge and this weird set of stick -em icons that keep my ass on the couch. See, I could see a world where I can send my pre-programmed button to somebody else and say, hey, you know what? If you love me, every once in a while, press this button and it'll send me something I need. I really wanted to hack into Chibert's K thing and have a big truck of K cups. <laughs> back up to I'm sad that they, damn. I was, I was actually just thinking about that. I mean, they are wireless devices. You should be able to hack them. And if you can, can you just start ordering stuff for people? Oh. Yeah, you know what? You need 5,000 cases of detergent. <laughs> The thing is, Brian would just drink them. He, he wouldn't care. Okay. Oh, okay, folks, this has been a lot of fun, but I'm sorry, but that's all the time we have for this episode of This Week at Enterprise Tech. That's right. You've spent the last hour listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of ten one-click buttons from Amazon. <laughs> uh, I, I want to thank my, my panelists for being here because they do make the show. Let's start with you, Oliver. It, it's yeah. always great to have you on. I know you are a crazy, crazy busy person. Uh, could you please tell the folks where they can find you and your work? Delete busy. Just crazy person. Just crazy Just, person. Uh, you, you're not going to find my work right now. I'm, I'm not on InfoWorlds where, where my public work would appear. I just haven't been doing any of it. Uh, you are my sole public um, uh, outlet for, uh, uh, for the next couple of months. I haven't. I don't think I've got anything going with InfoWorld. Well, we'll keep having you back because it's yeah. it's just always a blast to have you. You you bring a, a breath of fresh air because you're not afraid to tell us that we're being stupid, like with the dash. Although I still think it's a brilliant idea. Uh. <laughs> And we'll just leave it at that. Now, Chibert, my Dash brother, my, my, my brother in Dash arms here, where can they find you? Well, if you'd had dinner last night at Urban Putt, you would have seen me there playing putt-putt with Curtis Franklin and my wife, Kathy. Um, anyone living in the Bay Area, I strongly recommend. Go go down to, uh, I think it's, um, it's in the Mission District off 22nd. Anyway... Go for dinner and then have an evening of putt-putt. Uh, there's 14 holes of just amazingly creative holes. My favorite is actually the San Francisco Earthquake Hole or the Day of the Dead Hole. But you, there's all kinds of stuff right down to a Transamerica w Tower windmill. So why don't you head over? You can actually see signs of me. I'm actually on the Kickstarter plaque in the back. And I help set up the network for my ex-editor-in-chief of InfoWorld and Macworld who happens to be running Urban Putt. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for being part of this week in Enterprise Tech. We will see you all again. But uh, before we sign off, we want to thank you. That's right, the person who listens to this show, who downloads it, who has it on his or her device. Without you, we wouldn't have the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. So we want to thank you. And we're going to thank you by making it easier for you to get the show automatically just go to our show page at twit.tv slash quiet there you'll find our entire back catalog all the way back to episode one all those months and years ago and you'll also find our show notes so if there was a particular story that you wanted to see more about you wanted to read up personally about you're going to find the links there it also includes a little drop down menu so that you can have a subscription your device of choice automatically with our latest episodes. That's right. You want the audio version on your iPhone so you can listen on the way to work. Maybe you want it on your tablet so that you can watch video during your break. Or maybe on your Mac, your PC, your desktop, your laptop. 
so you can plug it into your big screen TV and get Twiat in all its HD goodness. You can do that at twit.tv slash twiat. I also want to remind you that you can follow me on Twitter. Just go to twitter.com slash PadreSJ. That's at PadreSJ. There you will find every week what we're going to be doing on all the shows that I do, including This Week in Enterprise Tech. If you want to suggest a guest for a future show, if you want to give us your words of wisdom about a topic that we've covered, or if you just want to see what I do when I'm not on Twit TV, it's twitter.com slash PadreSJ. Finally, thanks to everyone here in the Brick House who makes this show possible, to Lisa and Leo, of course, Karsten, my super producer, and my TD extraordinaire. That's right, he's the Eskimo. Zach, could you please tell the folks where they can find you and uh, your work? Thanks, Padre. You guys can find me on Twitter at Eskimo Zach, and you can also find me Thursday nights TDing This Week in Computer Hardware and Wednesday late afternoon TDing all about Android. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balliser reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. <laughs>